Well, this morning, if you have your Bible, will you turn with me to Romans chapter 1? Here at Calvary Chapel, our distinctive is to teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. That's what we do. That's what makes us distinct uh, from perhaps other good churches that are out there. And so um, we don't really pick the topic that we're going to teach from. We just teach whatever's next on the page. And so we don't target anybody in the audience and we don't go after anybody. We just teach God's word from cover to cover. Uh, we try not to uh, shy away from teaching the whole counsel of God, from Genesis to Revelation, and then once we're done, just repeat and repeat until the Lord takes us home. But this morning, uh, I've titled this message, Homosexuality, because this is where we find ourselves in the scriptures, and the scripture covers every single topic that uh, we deal with in, in human life. So uh, we are going to be looking at verses 26 through 32. And so, um, you know, this is a, not a topic I would ever choose to teach on uh, out of my own flesh. Um, but um, if you do have kids that maybe you don't want them to be part of this message, there's a children's ministry room and you can go there. However, um, these days, king, kids are being indoctrinated with so much lies regarding this topic uh, that maybe God wants to equip uh, the saints and the kids for the work of the ministry, and this is part of it. So let me read you um, Romans chapter 1, verse 26 to the end of the chapter. It says, For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even the women exchanged the natural use what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to the base mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So that's our, our uh, text this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for that text. <laughs> but we have to trust that he knows what he's doing. Um, before I exposit that text, I want to read you the next verse, which is Romans 2, 1. So next Sunday's message, we're starting uh, chapter 2 in Romans. So chapter 2 starts like this. Therefore, you are inexcusable, men, whoever you are who judge. For whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And then it goes on. So just know that this message is not coming from a heart of judgment. And if it is coming from a heart of judgment, we're really in trouble with the Lord ourselves. So we're not trying to get ourselves in trouble in our relationship with the Lord, but we're for sure not going to shy away from God's word. We're not going to take away from God's word because Revelation tells us if you take away from God's word, he's going to take your name out of the book of life. We don't add to God's word because when you add to, you put extra things there in the Bible from yourself, then God is going to add the plagues of Egypt to your life according to the book of Revelation. So we deal with this very carefully. We don't want to take away from the Bible. We want to put things in the Bible, but we just, we just want to let God speak for himself. So that's what we do. We let God speak for himself. These are not our inventions. These are not ideas. This is the word of God. Now, um, the New Living Translation um, you know, is used by Greg Laurie to evangelize. Uh, Billy Graham used the, the New Living Translation also to evangelize the world and to reach the world for Christ. And there's brothers here at Calvary Chapel up the coast that also use the New Living Translation to teach their uh, congregation. You know, um, in the book Calvary Distinctives by Ch Pastor Chuck Smith, he encourages the pastors how to use sermon prep. And so the way Calvary Chapel uh, pastors pre prepare their sermons, according to the Calvary Chapel Distinctives, is we read the passage that we're going to teach. We go over the passage about 50 to 60 times. So our most, the most of our sermon prep is observing the text, observing the text. So there's observation, there's interpretation, and there's application. 
So 85, 90%, 95% of our sermon preparation at Calvary Chapel is we observe the text, and we observe the text, and we observe the text. And I don't know if you've ever listened to like a favorite song 60 times, but you kind of get sick of it at some point, and you probably have it memorized. And uh, there's just so much blessing into reading the text. So that's what we strive to do. And so we go over the text, go over to the text, go over the text. After we've done that, after we've accomplished that, then uh, we don't necessarily jump to, um, to commentaries, you know. Um, we uh, look at other translations. So as you look at a different translation, I kind of go to, after I um, read uh, my passage in the New King James Version, I, I, I check with the King James Version, and then my third go-to is the NLT, just personally as a personal preference. And so I look at the NLT, and it really uh, kind of sheds some light on some of those things. And so uh, the NLT is not a, uh, um, a commentary. It's actually a Bible translation. And so I look at that, and then, um, then I look at commentaries. Um, but for me, commentaries, it's a lot of work with very little profit. So I spend a lot of time in there, and I get like a nugget or, or, or truth. But when you're into God's Word, God just inspires your thoughts. You know, you read it, you read the text like 10 times, and you're like, and then you read it 30 times, and you're like, oh, that's in there? I didn't see that the whole time. And then the Lord just brings back ideas like, oh, talk about this, make this connection, make this relation. So just spending that time, um, the Lord just really inspires our, our, our sermons there. And so because of that reason, I would like to read you this text in the NLT, because it's a little more um, different than the New King James. So let me read you. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 to 32 in the NLT. It says, That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turn against the natural way to have sex instead of indulging in sex with each other. The men, instead of having natural sexual relationships with women, burn with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that they should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud boasters. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyways. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So it just brings a little more definition on the text. Um, I feel like New King James is very concealing, uh, but it looks like the NLT is really revealing uh, this, this part of the scripture. You know, our nation has declared June... Uh, Pride Month. Why pride? You know, the Bible says that we need to repent of pride. In America, people are departing from science, they're departing from biology, and they're departing from chemistry. And more importantly, they're departing from the Word of God, the Bible itself. Instead, they are celebrating sexual behaviors. Homosexuality and the LGBT community practice Practice a lifestyle that is not healthy. This lifestyle does not work. Science says so, and so does God. Now, there are some things you might hear as a Christian if you take a biblical stand against or embrace the LGBTQ agenda during which they call the Pride Month. The reality is that the suicide rates in this community is at an all-time high. The levels of depression and anxiety amongst the people in the LGBT community, it is not due to the Christian worldview. It is not due to what God has declared that the lifestyle is wrong. That is not why the suicide rate is high, depression is high, and anxiety is high. Some people claim that, that that's why they want to harm themselves, because Christians are basically saying what the Bible says, and so that's causing people to harm themselves. So therefore, Christians need to be quiet and not declare God's truth so you can be loving and, uh, and help people not harm themselves and become depressed. They tell us, don't believe what the Bible says. Don't believe the word of God. We're told, don't read your Bible. 
don't believe what Paul wrote in the book of Romans. And definitely don't share with people what God's word has to say. Because when you do that, when you share with people what God's word actually says for itself, then you are the one that's causing people in the LGBT community to harm themselves. You are causing their depression. It's your fault. And you're causing their extreme anxiety. So please recognize something about Satan's tactics here. Satan's tactics is deception. Last Wednesday, we covered the gift of discernment. You might want to go on our YouTube channel and, and uh, listen to that message to be discerning people. Do you remember back in the Garden of Eden when Satan convinced Adam and Eve that sin was to enlighten them, that they would become like gods? But they were caught in sin by God. They wanted to blame other people. Do you remember? Adam said, it's the woman. The woman said, it's the serpent. Right? It's not my fault. It's the woman's fault. The lady said, it's not. Eve said, it's not my fault. It's the serpent's fault. So, so it is in the LGBT community. It's not their fault. It's the Christian's fault. It's a, it's a deception of Satan that pushes blame to other people. It's the Christian's fault that I'm depressed because they're telling me what the Bible says. So that causes my depressions. And now I want to go and I want to harm myself. So it's the Christian's fault. So legislature, shut down the Christians. And by the way, burn those Bibles too. Eliminate that and then I can be happy. The reality is that there is a lot of pain because of this sin. There's pain that is involved. And we don't laugh at that. We're actually hurting with, with them and we feel for them. But that is because sin is the one that causes the pain. So dear brother and sister, please know that it's not the Christian worldview or God's declaration about what is sinful that is causing anxiety in people's lives. It is not causing depression. It is not causing suicide. It is the sin itself that is causing all those things. Suicide, depression, and anxiety. And if you are here today and you are practicing a homosexual lifestyle, you might be dealing with these real feelings. Maybe you're attracted to the same sex. And maybe you're confused about your sexuality. And just know that just because it feels right, it doesn't mean it's the right thing for you. It's not necessarily what's your best interest. What's in your best interest is to know your God and to know that he became a man to live a perfect life here on earth and you can be forgiven of your sins. He died on a cross for your pain, for your anxiety, for your suicidal thoughts. Christ calls us back to him. The Holy Spirit wants you to know that you are not hated. God loves you. But it's your sin that is causing your sickness. So when you hear Christians speaking out against the LGBTQ lifestyle, it's because we know the pain and the, the sin and the pain that is caused in people's lives. And we love people enough to get them to be on a rescue mission, to rescue them from this pain. As a Christian, you do not need to feel guilty as if you did something wrong when you speak out against the LGBTQ lifestyle. You did not cause anybody to be depressed. You did not cause anybody to have anxiety. And you did not cause anybody to harm themselves because you called sin, sin. You trust the Lord. It's only God's truth, the Bible, that's going to set people free and actually help them. So here in our text, it says in verse 26, For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. God gave men over until they were completely lost and they realized their need for the Savior. So if a person will return and submit themselves to the truth, Jesus will set them free um, from that power and manner of life. Now, at Calvary Chapel, we don't take, they take things out of context. We try not to take things out of context. So that's why we study the whole Word of God. We study the whole Book of Romans. So we look at how does this passage of Scripture in chapter 1, 
how does it fit in with the whole book of Romans? And how does the book of Romans fit in with the whole counsel of God? And as you look through the whole book of Romans, Paul is writing this letter and he's making this argument. And he's basically painting a backdrop of the depravity of uh, Gentiles in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he's going to paint a picture of the depravity of the Jews. Even though they had the law, that still didn't get them into heaven. And they're still lost without a Savior. And then God's grace is going to come forth. And then you can appreciate God's grace because you understand what you're saved from. So in the context, that's the, that's the flow of the book of Romans. So if, you know, you can, you can make the Bible say anything you want to say. For example, did you know in the Bible says there is no God? So if you only look at those words, you say the Bible teaches that there's no God. But when you look at the context before that, it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So what does the Bible really teach? Does the Bible really teach that there is no God? Or does the Bible say only fools say that there's no God? So in context, it's a different meaning. So we can take pieces out of the scripture and we can twist the scripture to, to our own destruction and make it say anything we want to say. And that's what we try to stay away from. And that's what we need prayer for, that we'll never be guilty of that. And so in context, this is the flow of the book of Romans. It says that even the women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. You know, God created our bodies and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In creating our bodies, he created them male and female. And despite what they're trying to tell you, there is a vast difference. We are physically different and thank God for those differences. My body was not created to bear children. I cannot be pregnant because I am a man. And I don't have the capacity of bearing children because I am a man. When God created us, he created us for survival and for propitiation of the human race. The command was to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth. In order for the body to continue to exist, God created in our bodies certain drives to sustain life. The strongest is the air drive. We need to breathe. You can find out if you go underwater, you'll find out how strong the air drive is for survival. The next drive in our body is the thirst drive. Try not to drink anything for, and go out in the heat, and you'll learn very quickly that you need to drink something to survive. This is just an automatic survival thing that God has built into us, these drives. Next, you need food. And so if you go without food, you have the hunger drive. And all these three systems are meant to keep us alive and to keep us going. They're built in within us. They're essential for survival, air, water, and food. But after those three drives, the next most powerful drive that is built into every single human is the sex drive. This sex drive is not needed for survival for yourself to sustain your life, but it is needed for the human uh, life to exist on earth. And so if everybody, uh, you know, were, was not in a heterosexual relationship, the whole world would just stop producing humans. <laughs> and that is not God's will. God's will is to continue, just like there are seeds in tomatoes and there's seeds in all kinds of stuff. And God just wants it to go on and on. That's his will. And he can do whatever he wants because he created us and he designed us that way. So this was designed by God. It's part of his plan to make us male and female. And he has played, placed inside of each one of us by which males are attracted to females and females are attracted to males. This is God's design to bring a male and a female together in the bond of marriage so that the human race will continue to go on and to survive and not go extinct. Only a man and a female can have kids together. Anything other than that, this is self-gratification. It is selfish. It is not honoring God, but is rebelling against God. Some men have taken these beautiful things of God and have twisted them for their own personal use. There is a proper use of things, of all kinds of things. And there is also the abuse of things that man has created. The sex drive has been abused. It has been changed from God's plan and purpose for some, and now they want to shove this abuse down our throats that we would change from God's design as well. 
God didn't really mean what he said, they tell you. You know, that sounds like somebody I read about in the book of Genesis in the beginning chapters. I heard that voice before. I've heard that tune. It's the same playbook. It sounds like the snake in the Garden of Eden. God didn't mean what he said. As a matter of fact, that's not what God said at all. That's not what the Bible says. Trust me, they say. I will lead you to enlightenment. You don't need to trust God in the Bible. Trust me, because I know better. I'll trust, lead you, and you will too will be like God. You too can be the creator. You don't have to be the creation. You can create. You can put Lego pieces together and move them around, and you're, you're creating things. You're the new creator. And do what pleases you with your sex drive. And by the way, if you do that, I can guarantee you you're not hurting anybody. So just go ahead and do it. One statistic shows us that one in four have been abused or, bit or misused by this drive. That's 25%. So we understand that there's a lot of hurt going out around us. Now in the text, as you notice, it does not say that they were born this way. That is not what the text says but that they, cho they chose to go this way. They suppressed the truth and exchanged the truth for a lie. They bought into it. The lie became their truth. Part of the lie is that God made you this way and you were meant to be this way. That's why you struggle with this and you have that tendency. It's God's fault. He made you like that. So placing blame on God. This is a lie from the devil himself, obviously. And it goes on to say that also, likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. This is a perverting of God's natural function of the use of the body. It doesn't matter how much you object to it, it's perverted. This is not God's ordained design. Homosexuality is a result of human and moral depravity. People are not born homosexuals, but they have given over to their own lusts or strong desires in their hearts. I totally reject the lame excuse and the lie that some people who come to me and tell me that God has made me this way. They're essentially saying that God has created me to be a pervert. No, God has made us male and female. I do not believe that this choice is hereditary, but it is environmental. It is unnatural, and it doesn't matter how much they cry for acceptance, celebration, it is unnatural. They burn in lust for one another. This literally means that they actually burn out. Even if our culture widely accepts this, awards this, gives you a job because of your sexual orientation instead of your skill set, and gives you parades, forces you to take educational classes and continue education units in order for you to keep your job, men who give themselves to it, they find out just how hopeless and how dissatisfying this lifestyle is. And when they started this ungodly pursuit, they will never find fulfillment in a relationship un until that God-shaped heart in their heart is filled with Jesus Christ, the living God. In some people's minds, homosexual homosexuality is outside of their control. Just like the color of your skin is outside of your control, your height, or anything else. But the Bible declares this is a sin. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Just like fornication is a sin, homosexuality is a sin. And there's a difference between homosexual behavior and homosexual tendencies or inclinations or attractiveness. There's a difference there. The difference is between the act of sin and the condition of being tempted because we are all tempted with some form of sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. 
When you're tempted, that's not sinful. That means you're human. Because we're all tempted. But what you do with that temptation decides whether you sin or you turn away from sin and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are here today and you struggle with same-sex attraction, you need to turn from that. Take the way of escape. You don't need to feel guilty for being tempted, but you need to turn away from it and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that homosexuality is a result of denying and disobeying God. Now, there, there are some who say that you can be a homosexual and you can be a Christian at the same time. This is unbiblical. Repent of sin. Just like any other sin, sin is sin. And sin separates us from God. This is why Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. So that we don't continue living in sin, but that we might be delivered from its power thereof. Sin put Jesus on the cross. And it's important for us to repent of all sin. It is possible that some have been born with the greater susceptibility to the same-sex attraction. That is possible, and I believe that's true. Just like you might be born with something that makes you more prone to commit another sin. We're all more prone to do certain things. You might have a temper, you know, and you say that you're Irish or you're Italian, and, uh, you know, you should be excused from hurting people and knocking them out when you feel like it, because God made you that way. But that doesn't excuse you. That's called your flesh. You need to repent of your flesh. It's the same thing here. It's just people are struggling with a different type of flesh. You have your flesh. Others have their flesh. So that's why we're not judging people, but we're on a rescue mission to love people. But this does not excuse a person from choosing to sin and giving into sinful desires. You need to ask God to change you and to alter you. The same is true with any sin. Some people are susceptible to homosexuality. Homosexual behavior is sinful. So we want to turn away from it. You want to run away from sin no matter what it is. We have denied what God said that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. No matter what our government, our court system, our legislature, vote on you know that's just humans voting you could be on the court you can be a judge you can be a lawmaker any human can you just vote right do you make mistakes sometimes yes do they make mistakes sometimes yes they're not infallible there's a higher court even than the supreme court there's a greater judge over all the earth and what he says that's what goes you might be married as a woman to another woman, but God doesn't acknowledge that marriage. He loves you, and He wants you to repent of your sin and turn from it, but if you continue in it and you die in that sin, the Bible makes it very clear, like just any other sin, if you die in a practicing sin, that heaven is not in your future. But heaven can be in your future if you will turn and live. There is no sin that God cannot forgive if you turn to Him, but you have to acknowledge that sin and you have to turn away from it. But the lie that we're told today is that this is not sin. And what's even more tragic is that some in the Christian circles have actually ordained homosexual ministers. This is not right. This is not biblical. God does not honor this. The world say, How unloving you are for giving this message and for saying that. Now, the world can judge my heart if I'm loving or not. Only God can judge my heart. And he knows that I'm very loving in this message. This has nothing to do with being judgmental, angry, or bitter at any person. It has everything to do with their eternal destiny. We love people enough and we want to see them in heaven. Today, we are called evil because we affirm what the Bible says about sin. Not just sexual sin, but all sin. So some people say, this is a sickness. It is not a sickness. Some people say, this is just an alternate lifestyle. This is not an alternate lifestyle. This is sin. That is what the Bible calls it, 
And you can put a fancy name on it. You can make it sound nicer. But it's not natural. It's not what God intended for you. It is shameful and it is painful. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. When we retain God in our knowledge, when we think about the Lord, that means that God will hold us accountable for the way we live. There are certain choices that we need to make. But people who want to be in charge of their own lives work very hard to push God out of their minds, hoping that if they don't think about God, they try not to believe in God. This is actually very difficult every day, trying to think like God doesn't exist. That somehow God is just going to go away. You know, He's not limited to our puny little brains. We're finite people. He's infinite. So just because you're covering your hand you're covering your eyes with your hand and you don't see the sun, that doesn't make the sun go away or have the effects that the sun has. When we acknowledge that there is a God, then we are responsible for what the Lord requires of us. But we don't want God to require anything of us. We want to be in charge. We want to do whatever we want to do. We want to sin freely and hold no responsibility at all. I want to live in my own lustful life, and I don't want to answer to anybody. So the natural conclusion is to try to eliminate God. But when you try to get rid of God in your mind, there is a heavy guilt that instantly comes in, and people live with that heavy guilt. I do not wish that guilt upon anybody. It's probably one of the worst things in the world. And some of that leads people to mental illness. There's a lot of mental illness that develops because people do not like to retain God in their knowledge. You go crazy. It's just God's design that God would be in your mind. There's psychiatric, uh, psychiatric medications that people get put on, but the majority is that they push God out of their minds. And as a result, God gave them over to the base mind. You say, you don't want me? your mind is going to be altered. Your thinking is not going to be straight. No pun intended. That was, that was not planned. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. God gave them over to the base bind, and they were given up to uncleanness. They just dishonored their bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Many people try to explain the universe apart from God. God is not necessary for the solar system and for us to be here. And if God is not necessary, then we can just dishonor our bodies within ourselves. So we hear so much about Mother Nature, the cre creature, the cre creation. Even as I was typing up this message, I typed in Mother Nature, and you know what happened? They capitalized it for me. They capitalized the N in mother, and they capitalized the N in nature, as if mother nature was divine. And then I, I typed in God, G-O-D, and they did not capitalize G for me. It's built into our word processors. Mother nature is divine, and God is just a figment of somebody's imagination. To do those things which are not fitting but being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, there are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. There's about 20, 21 things here that Paul, Paul shows us the depths of human depravity to which men have sunk. Remember, Paul was writing 2,000 years ago. It seems like he's writing to us today. There's nothing new under the sun, but he's actually writing 2,000 years ago because these things were happening in Rome. This, this letter is written by Paul to the Romans. This was happening in their culture. America was not even uh, discovered. We were not a nation when this letter was written. So don't tell me I'm coming here hating somebody. This was not even, has nothing to do with America. But yet... Look at God's word, how it transcends time. Unrighteousness is the opposite of justice. Premarital sex or extramarital sex, sex outside of marriage, is all fornication. Wickedness, 
is being a destructive person that actually has a desire to harm other people. There's some people who are just vicious. You remember, this reminds me of the days of Noah, right? As I teach my little kids at night stories and you know, they're fighting, I'm like, are you guys being like the days, you know? You saw, you saw the pictures, the Bible picture books. See how they're fighting? And they're laughing at Noah, preacher of righteousness, but he found grace in God's eyes. And God spared his life and his kids and the wives. And this is why we have a safety team here at church that keeps us safe. And thank God for police officers too. <laughs> we will not defund the police. Covetousness is the unsatisfying desires of having more, also desiring what belongs to somebody else. They are backbiters, people who slander other people. You might be speaking to somebody and uh, they're right in front of you and um, they're talking bad about somebody else to you. I can almost guarantee you <laughs> that the exact same thing that they're doing behind their back to you, they're gonna do the exact thing about you <laughs> to somebody else. Therefore, stop them right in their tracks. Be brave in the Lord. What do you have to lose? You don't have to be a chicken and just submit to evil. Just stop them right in their tracks. Call them out and pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that God will help you. But it is not godly to listen to gossip. You're not pleasing God. You're not doing that person any favor. And you're not doing any favor to yourself. This is an attempt to destroy people by whispering about them. Haters of God is a defiance of God in their attitude. This is the world in which we are a part of. We're not in the world. Or we're in the world, but we're not a part of the world. Now, people have been trying to get rid of God forever. I love, uh, I think I was, um, I forgot his name, Volt Voltaire, or whatever his name is. It's irrelevant what his name is. But he tried to de destroy Bibles, and he actually burned a bunch of Bibles. And then after he died, his own home became a printing press for the Bible. <laughs> so hashtag, newsflash, Jesus wins. People have been trying to get rid of God, and that's because people have been living a life in a lifestyle that's alienated from God. Our society has been working very hard to put God away in their thinking, and as a result, they've given themselves to a mind that is without Jesus Christ. This mindset without Jesus Christ is reprobate. Reprobate? I can't, I'm from Romania, so. <laughs> God used a donkey. Reprobate. There you go. Now remember that Paul wrote this to the generation in Rome and to the Gentile world. And these are the same things that we're dealing with today in our society. Did you know that in the Roman Republic, in the first 323 years, there was not one single divorce? Well, now you know, because I told you. But by the time the Roman Republic became the Roman Empire, as Paul was writing this letter to Rome, they're having wife swapping, and you read of women having eight marriages in five years. Nothing was thought of mar the marriage vows. And this is the world that Paul lived in, and he wrote. Did you know that 11 out of the first 12 Roman emperors were homosexuals? And as Paul was writing these things to the Roman church, he was writing things of which they were very familiar with. This was not foreign to them because Rome had degraded to just about the same extent as the degradation that we have today. The problem with this degradation is that each generation takes it a little step farther. They become more and more debased. You know, maybe as a parent, you kind of gave in to a certain sin, you know, and uh, you tell your kids, hey, like, don't do this, what I do, you know? And then they see you, and then they do what you do, but then they do even worse than you, you know? Maybe you just, you just smoke a little weed in your house, you know? No, no big deal. I have, a, I have a medical marijuana card. The doctor said it's my back that hurt me 17 years ago, but I still renew it, you know? It's just, it's just marijuana, you know? Drugs open up the spiritual realm to demons. And so your kid, you know, they use this gateway drug, and next thing you know, they're doing... Uh, heavy drugs. 
right? The next generation looks what you did, and then they go even deeper as a whole, unless that kid says, you know what? The way I grew up, I saw all the hurt in my family. I saw all the darkness, and I saw all their choices. And then I saw how depressed they were. I saw how unhappy they were. I saw how much pain they faced in their life. And they were telling me, hey, you, you're a little kid. I was 10 years old. Hey, little kid, become like us. Make the same choices as us. And I said to myself, in my mind and in my heart, I want to be nothing like you guys. Everything you guys are doing, I see what it produces. And that is the worst thing. I don't want that to be my life. Because you do the same thing, you're going to end up in the same thing or worse. So unless somebody, you know, God doesn't have any grandchildren. You cannot go to heaven because your dad's a pastor or born-again Christian or saved. You have to have your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you can break that, that example, that bad example that some of our parents gave us. You can break because you're your own person with your own free will to your own God. And that's the only way that you don't go back into worse and worse degradation. But for the most part, every generation becomes a little bit more degraded until we have a revival. Praise God for revivals. We have the Jesus people revival and then people turn to the Lord, right? But then as you slowly start, and we need another revival, Lord. And I need it right here in the circle. Start with me. What do I need to repent of? I'm not perfect. I haven't reached anything. I'm saved by grace through faith. If it wasn't for God, where would I be? I'd be lost. I used to live a life when I was going to church and I was scared that I was going to be separated from God for eternity because I wasn't repented. I wasn't born again. It's a terrible place to be. But I'm not there today. I have the peace of God. I have peace with God. I know. To be absent from bodies, to be present with the Lord because Jesus' blood is applied to my account. And so God, at some point, history tells us that this corruptness from generation to generation becoming more corrupt, eventually it will destroy a society and it will not stand. And you know, Rome, it fell. The Roman Empire fell. But Rome was not conquered from without. Rome was rotted from within. So who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This world that we live in is a filthy, evil world. It's a world that God loves. He still loves us. And he still loves all the humans. And he proved his son. He proved his love by sending his son on the cross. The Bible says that greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus came to redeem us and to save us. This is where we can appreciate the love of God and not take it for granted or not just call it a common thing because we see the depths of the depravity of men. Paul's intention here is to show us the depths which His grace has reached to save us and to redeem lost men. Now even we who perhaps haven't sunk to such depths of depravity, maybe you look at this list and you say, well, I'm, I haven't done everything on that list. Paul's not going to give you a pass either. As you keep reading the book of Romans, God will highlight something for you that will also make you guilty before God. And you'll see in future studies he will show us that we're there guilty with him. That's what Romans 2 says. You who judge, you're practicing the same things. So we're not to judge others because the moment we judge others, we become guilty of the same things because we practice the same things. They need a Savior, and we need a Savior. He has justified us and sanctified us, and now we rejoice in this glorious grace in which we stand. But this is what happens when a person deletes God out of their mind. So you see people around, don't be mad at them. Just know they made a choice to hit the delete button on that file in their minds of God. And they're doing that over and over again. But you know, that button, it's, it's a sticky key, it doesn't work. <laughs> they're like, delete, I'm oh, still there, delete, delete. What kind of paranoia? Can you imagine living that lifestyle? where daily you're trying to delete God? That's insanity. 
because you're doing the same thing, expecting a different result, do you really think you're, you're strong? How prideful and arrogant you are that you think you can delete God out of your mind and out of your memory. And I just want you guys to know, it's not that God sends judgment on people. Don't think that God sends judgment. God wants to prevent people from judgment. That's why he says, choose life. Choose this way. Judgment is going to come to you if you choose this. But I'm telling you, don't choose this. Because this choice comes with judgment. God, God is not like angry and he's like judging people. He's telling you, if you don't do what I tell you, there's judgment. I'm sparing you from judgment. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at my back. Look at the throne of crowns on my head. Look at my side bleeding for you. I'm trying to spare you from judgment. But it's a spiritual law that judgment is there, and it's more real than gravity. And we have signs that say, don't jump off buildings because you will die. So don't jump off. Don't go away from the Lord because there will be spiritual death. So it's, please know that it's not that God sends judgment upon a person. It's that God wanted to spare you judgment by telling you not to do these things. But people bring judgment upon themselves. They're responsible for that judgment. It is, God is not at fault. God has given us so many ways out. He even gave his life for you. But people still neglect God's word. They banish God out of their minds, out of their conscience, out of the school system. They become like people in our text today. There's mass confusion where people don't know right from wrong. It's where man reaches an ultimate, ultimate low in perversity. When we call evil good and good evil, you know that we have reached the point of dark depravity. Doing what I want, no one can tell me different. I don't believe that. Here is a result of wickedness, but also perverting everybody else. They want you to parade with them. I want everybody else to be into this. I want you to come to the parades with me. If you're not going to celebrate my sexuality, then I'm going to come after you. Legally, physically, I'm going to yell at you. I'm going to cancel you. You're going to lose your business. You're going to lose your livelihood if you don't celebrate my sexuality. You either celebrate this or you will face the consequences. Let's face the consequences. Face the consequences. To be a Christian, it's going to cost you something. It cost John the Baptist his head. It cost Joseph 12 years in prison for integrity. Christian is not for the faint of heart. It will cost you something. You want to be a Christian? It's not just feel good on Sunday. There will be a cost to it. Face the cost. Jesus faced the cost. He'll sustain you. He'll empower you. Face the cost. They're going to cancel you. They're going to take away your business. They're going to take away your job. Is God not able to give you something else? Is he not able to give you a better life than you had? If you do what's right and they take it away from you, you're all here, well done, good and faithful servant. And he'll provide for you. David said, I once was old and now I'm young. Here's what King David learned. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor God's people begging bread. Stop being scared to, to, to keep your job. I can guarantee you, even if you say, I'm going to be ungodly, and I'm going to go celebrate this, and I'm going to submit to this idol, there's zero guarantees that God will not get you fired anyway. <laughs> that doesn't mean you'll keep your job. Because God chastened those who he loves. So it's just a false reality that you need to compromise in order to keep your home, to keep your job, to have money in the bank, so compromise. And that's why there's so many people that don't speak out because they're scared of losing all those things. But praise God if you're somebody that's lost all those things and then you saw that God gave them all back to you. So you don't have to be quiet. Man, what freedom we have in Christ. They tell you, put the rainbow on your work badge at work, you got it right here on your chest. By the way, you know, the rainbow has seven colors. Seven is the number of completion of, from the Lord. This rainbow has six colors. Six is the color of man, is the number of man, right? You have 666, three men, the Antichrist. So, you know, it's, forgot a color. Praise God. Well, now they're adding a whole bunch of other colors. So, uh, who knows? They're like 12, 13 colors. Um, the Alphabet Club. But put your pronouns in your signature. 
You know, you have 50, 57 options to choose from for your gender, right? So you're like, you know, just write a whole paragraph of your sexuality and just let us know as it's constantly evolving and people are constantly taking advantage of you and they're abusing you and then you're abusing other people. So let that be the master passion of your life. Get abused and abusing people. Yeah, let's live for that. That makes sense. Take continuing education courses that educate you on being evil, be, evil being good and good being evil. All these things we see in our text today. This is what marks our country in 2024. Actually, our country more than a lot of countries in the world. Not everybody, not everybody in the world does this kind of stuff. But we're, our nation, we're on top of the edge. We're progressive. We're really making progress on eliminating God and putting ourselves up as gods. I'll tell you here, dear sister, dear brother, our nation is on the edge of collapse. If it's not for God's grace, so was Nineveh, so there's hope. Actually, Jonah, he went and he said, 40 days, you're all going to die. And I, I don't even want you guys to get saved. That was Jonah's message. You're all dying. Bye. And you deserve it. But those people repented at the preaching of Jonah in sackcloth and ashes, and God spared them. So there's hope, but the hope only comes in repentance and turning to Jesus Christ. So we're called for such a time as this, to share this message. It's very timely. We need to pray, and we need to vote in November. We have a lot of work to do, church. We need to call sin, sin, because we have been called for such a time as this, just like Esther. Esther said, if I go in, I might die. Mordecai said, if you don't go in, you're probably going to die anyways. At least go. You know, there are some, some uh, lepers that were just dying, and they're just waiting to die. And they said, well, why don't we venture out in faith and try? You know, if we try and they kill us, well, we're going to die of starvation anyways. But if we try, at least we might survive. It's in the Word of God. And guess what? They tried and they survived. That's the only hope for you and to save those around you. It's not to be quiet. It's to speak the truth in love. We are actually living in very exciting times. We are the salt and light of the earth. We're to have a preserving influence in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. This is why Jesus came to save us from the depravity of men. He came into this filth, the filth of this world, and he suffered and died to identify with us so that we can be saved. If you look at the categories that we just covered in our text today, you can surely find yourself in one of them, or two, or three, or four. Be honest, and if you're not, don't find yourself in there, then I can find you in there. <laughs> Proud, lying, boaster, invent of your things. We're in there, trust me, guys. You're in there. If you don't find yourself in there, there's a lot of work to do. But when you find yourself in there and you repent, that's when times of refreshing comes from the Lord. You say, this is who I am, but I don't want to be this way. Help me. And get God transforms you. But if it wasn't for the grace of God, where would we be? We'd be right in the middle of this list we just covered as practicing lifestyle. But thank God for his grace. God loves sinners, no matter what the sin is. He loves you enough not to leave you that way. He loves you enough to give you a way of escape. He's calling all of us to repent of sin so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. God is so good. The Bible declares that He's good. So we don't look with condemnation at other sinners, whatever their sin is. We do not look with condemnation because we are right there too. But Jesus came to rescue us. And may the Lord help us to seek others and to show them the way that they can find forgiveness as well. And may we use the word of God to overcome temptation in our own lives, just like Jesus did, and share with others how they can overcome temptation, even though they have certain tendencies, the way Jesus did. And may the Lord grow our compassion in our hearts for people who are on their way to hell, even though they don't know it and they don't realize it. Amen? Amen. Father, your word, not my word, I would never come up with this topic or care to talk about it, Lord, but a lot of our kids 
a lot of working adults, we're saturated with this topic, Lord. And we're actually saturated with lies from the enemy, the same tune of the same voice that spoke in the Garden of Eden. You're, God didn't say that. That's not what God meant. Follow me, I will show you. Eat of this unforbidden fruit. You will be like God. You will know right from wrong. Father, I pray that you preserve your church, that we be holy. Holiness leads to happiness. Self-gratification leads to hurt, pain, destruction, suicide, and eventually hell. You said that you have two paths for us, and we are to choose this day, and you encourage us, choose life that you may live. Father, I pray that you show yourself strong on our behalf, that you anoint us, that you strengthen us, Lord, that you speak to us, and that you help us in every area that we need your help with. In Jesus' name, amen.